we have a 3D Bible study sheet right there in front of you on your table. And um, so take that and we'll work through just a portion of it. It's just a guide on how we study. And honestly, we're not going to get very far on the sheet, but I still want you to have one. And on your 3D Bible study sheet, um, you can write firstborn uh, somewhere on there. That's going to be the main idea for the text today. Colossians 1.15 is the verse, and we're going to work our way up to it. But first, we're going to divert and pray. So firstborn is a word that is in the text that we're going to capitalize on, and, and uh, we're going to see on the 3D Bible study sheet why we're going to dive into that word uh, here in just a moment. But let's take just a moment and pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And I pray, God, that if anyone here has never asked you for forgiveness, that they would uh, pause right now and say, God, I believe that you died on the cross and rose again for our sins. Please save me. And I pray, God, that they would genuinely uh, repent and place their faith and trust in you and then be enabled by your good Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures. And, Father, we know that by your Holy Spirit, we're able to comprehend um, your text, your words. Help us to not only comprehend them, but to apply them and to teach them. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, according to your 3D Bible study sheet, the first thing you need to do is to divert. We did. We just diverted and prayed. And now we're going to read the text here in just a moment. But number two, you'll see study nouns. And as we read the text, uh, today's word that we're going to study is firstborn. And I didn't get any farther in the study. I, I just landed on firstborn, and that's as far as I got. I got pages of notes just on that one word. I wanted to get through like five verses, but you who love to study the Bible know how that is. You can only go as far as the text will let you. And as you start to study, sometimes... You're there, and it is so good that you just got to keep mining, you know? You're going to keep going down that same shaft and get all you can. Well, let's work our way up to it, all right? Let's start with just some basic questions. Some of, the, some of you got a handout in weeks prior on the five W's, and so let me ask you a few of the questions regarding who, what, when, where, and why before we get going. Who are the recipients? The Colossians. What are their circumstances? Well, it's a threat of heresy, right? Coming into the church. When was the letter written? 61 AD. So it's easy to remember that because Jesus was born somewhere around 0 or 1 AD, something like that, and was crucified somewhere 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 AD. And now, 30 years later, you have the Apostle Paul writing to the Colossians, and Christianity is spreading like wildfire. And this uh, letter was written. You can ask the question, why was it written? It was to reestablish the deity of Christ. And so as time goes by, truths seem to get diluted, and you have to remind yourselves and remind everybody what we believe in. It's kind of like reminding your child to do their chores. You remind them and you remind them. And one of these days it sticks, right? And then as they become teenagers, it is all lost again. And then you start over again. So life seems to have this ebb and flow to it. And we need these reminders. So Paul is sending this letter to the Colossian church to re-strengthen their faith in Christ and understanding his deity. So let's start in chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll work our way through. I, I want to read all the way down to verse 20. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also, as it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Verse 7, 
just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the knowledge of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, there's our word, of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, here it is again, the firstborn, there's our word repeated, from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now as you go through this and you read this passage, passage repetitiously, there are a few things that you cannot miss. Number one, verses one and two, is a salutation. And then verses three all the way down to verse eight is thanksgiving. That is Paul thanking um, the Colossians for who they are in Christ. And then verses 9 to 14, you've got an unbelievable prayer. Folks, let me please beg and implore and challenge you to mark off this section in your Bible and to place your loved ones in this prayer and pray for them. It is so wonderful. Let me give you an example. I, I just want to I don't want to belabor the subject, but I want you to know how rich it is to pray for your spouse or your loved ones or your friends or your church or anybody according to this type of prayer. For this reason, in verse 9, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray. Okay, so here's the Apostle Paul's prayer. He is asking that we may be filled with the knowledge. So let me just uh, pray for my dear daughter, Abigail. Um, I pray for my daughters specifically, and this is a way, one way. There's many different ways to pray. There's all kinds of different prayers in the Bible. But this one here is kind of like at the top of my list, especially right now since we're studying through this. So listen to this. Dear God, I pray for Abigail, according to verse 9, that she would be filled with your knowledge and that she would have spiritual wisdom and understanding so that she will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, of you, and God, I pray that she would please you in all respects. I pray that she bears fruit in every good work. I pray that that fruit would increase, and I pray that her knowledge would increase. And then according to verse 11, I pray that she would be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might. I pray that she would be steadfast. I pray that she would be patient and filled with joy. I pray that she would be giving thanks to you, Father, for everything, and thank you for qualifying her to share in your inheritance. And God, I pray that you would continue to, to rescue her from the domain of darkness since you've transferred her from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and saved her. Thank you for her redemption. And I pray, God, that she would continue to praise your holy name for forgiving her of her sins. So that's one special way that you could just go through and make this prayer your own special way of praying. It's amazing. And you could spend an hour just placing people's names in this in a first-person way. It's tremendous. So not only would you see that this is a prayer in chapter 1, and after you get through that, you would also see, like we studied before, that there's a hymn, a song right here next in verses 15 to 20. And I mentioned before that I would have never picked up on the fact that this was a hymn. 
had it not been for the theologians that we study underneath and the studied notes and the commentaries that we read. And they have said for centuries and centuries and centuries that this has been recognized as a song, as a hymn. And this is how they praised God. This is a theologically rich hymn. There's nothing shallow about it. And it is a recognizable hymn with some additional aspects to it. Paul inserted some extra theological nuances that make it all the more richer. And he is overflowing at this point. So he has thanked God for the Colossians. And he has now moved from thanking them to praying for them. And in his prayer, he's overflowing now into a hymn of praise. And you may have experienced that kind of spiritual walk for yourself. If you have been praying diligently for someone, and maybe you're praising God for maybe a prayer request that has been answered, wow, you will overflow into singing and praising God. It's just tremendous. And so that is what seems to be happening right here in the text before us. And now that he has made all of these prayers and supplications to the Lord, I have wanted to explain the whole hymn tonight, but I got stuck and hung up on that word firstborn. Let's read it in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Let's talk about that word firstborn. And on your study, you know, on your 3D Bible study sheet, it says the second point is to dig. And the first point there is to study the nouns and to pick up a Bible dictionary and to study what you started there and went from there, and I'll just kind of lead you through uh, what I have found regarding the word firstborn. And uh, the reason why I studied this one word is because it was repeated. On your document there, on dig, it says to note repetitive words underneath number two and digging. And so as I read verses 15 to 20 over repetitiously, I saw, you know, just by observing the text, that firstborn was repeated not only in verse 15, but also in verse 18. So I um, decided to say to myself, well, what does firstborn mean? Well, it refers to rank. Uh, the original word here is protokos, prototokos. It refers to the highest, unique, matchless rank. He is the highest, most supreme being. He's first. There's no one before him. There's no one higher. There's no one more powerful. He's not created. He's the creator. He is the firstborn. And then it says down here in verse 18, he is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Well, what does that mean? The firstborn from the dead. Well, he was not the first one to be resurrected. You remember in the Gospel of John before Christ went to the cross and died and was resurrected, he resurrected Lazarus, right? And then there were Old Testament resurrections as well. So he wasn't the first one to be resurrected, but he was the highest of rank out of all of the first ones who had ever been resurrected. So he is the first protocos. He is the highest and the most supreme, the chiefest in all of who have ever been. Firstborn also refers to belonging to God. Check out Exodus chapter 13 with me as we kind of scrimmage through some of the scriptures to understand more about this word firstborn. Exodus 13, 1 and 2 talk about how the firstborn son for the Israelites had more responsibility and privileges because they belonged to God and more than just that, really. In Exodus 13, 1 and 2, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, it belongs to me. So the firstborn belongs to the Lord. It is his. The firstborn belongs to him, Exodus 13, 1 and 2. Now, since he belonged to God, the Father, get this, had to buy him back from the priest. Do you remember that in your Old Testament studies and readings ever? The firstborn had to be bought back. Numbers 18, 15. I'll read it to you. Numbers 18, 15, 14, yeah, 15 and following. Every first 
issue of the womb of all flesh, whether man or animal, which they offer to the Lord shall be yours nevertheless. The firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. As to their redemption price, from a month old you shall redeem them by your valuation, five shekels in silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 geras. So there was a, a buyback system there. It literally belonged, I mean, that firstborn belonged to God, and you had to go to the temple and, and, um, and buy him back from the priest. The birthright here as the firstborn included some interesting details. The firstborn uh, had the birthright, and that included a double portion. He was the next leader of the family. He was to take care of the sisters and the women. He took care of the mother until she died. He was to see that they had provisions. So the birthright included a double portion, and he was the next leader. He was to be groomed for that. And obviously, um, in the scriptures, you see over and over and over again where some who were born first lost their birthright. Because the birthright is more about character than it is position in Old Testament times. So the father had the right to say, your character isn't that which I want to lead the family. We're going to transfer that birthright to the next one down. And so um, character is the main idea sometimes we see in the scriptures. Figuratively, get this, Israel was God's firstborn according to Exodus 4.22. And within Israel, you have all the tribes. And there was a tribe who was considered the firstborn. And so within Israel, the tribe of Levi represented the firstborn of the nation, Numbers 3, 40 and 41. So not only for the whole um, Israeli people, you've got them considered as the firstborn of God, but then you have in the midst of the 12 tribes, a first there. Now you boil it down to the families. You also have the firstborn who had a favored position with more responsibilities and more privileges that go with that. So guess what? <laughs> um, as I was kind of boiling this down and thinking it through, I was surprised as to the New Testament application of this firstborn concept. When you carry this idea over into the New Testament, the application is incredible. So, born-again believers are now considered joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. We have an inherited, favored, privileged position with benefits and responsibilities. We are considered the firstborn of God in his household. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23 if you'd like and, and see this. What an amazing concept. Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. There it is. The church considered to be born-again believers, those who profess uh, Christ as Lord and Savior, who have pl placed their faith and trust in Him and Him alone. They're the church. It's not the building, it's the, it's the believers. So the church is considered the firstborn, and it says that they're enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Wow. So there it is. We are the church, the firstborn of God. Now, this brings... Um, a lot of light back to Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 when it says that we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now as the firstborn in Christ we now have an inheritance to think about. Now some of us have an inheritance to think about if maybe your parents are getting older. Um, maybe your parents have already died and you didn't have any inheritance, so you didn't have to think about it. Well, sometimes um, to put yourself in the position of the firstborn here, 
you have to really, really rethink what this means because this is not materialistic at all. This is completely spiritual. We have an inheritance as fellow heirs in Christ. We truly are heirs, fellow heirs with Christ. Um, let me read Romans 8, 16, and 17 to you. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This idea of being fellow heirs with Christ and having an inheritance is going to take precedence in your heart and mind in every way right now. And if we could take and transfer ourselves from being not so much in the world, but just, or not so much of the world, being in the world. There's a difference. So maybe we could take and say to ourselves, we're just passing through, we're in this world right now, but what are we living for? What are we truly, truly living for? Are we invested in a worldly inheritance or a spiritual inheritance? See, most of us are working towards a, a, an inheritance here on earth that's going to pass away, right? You, you're trying to build a kingdom up here on earth, and we're trying to accumulate money and possessions and things and power and whatever. Uh, retirement, maybe, perhaps, I mean, I remember seeing in South Carolina a huge plantation, and I had a friend of mine who was the heir, and when you drove past this plantation, the white wooden fence went for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles, and, miles. and you would see one plantation home after another after another, and it was staggering to think about all that was involved in this huge plantation. And this young man had been being groomed his whole life to take over from his father and running the plantation and all that was involved with all the employees and all the processes and all the businesses and all the mowing and all the homes and all the everything and even the bickering of the family, right? It's a lot to think about. Well, that's nothing. I mean, that's a speck of sand on the beach and compared to the inheritance that we have in Christ. The inheritance that you and I have been afforded by being fellow heirs in Christ is beyond explanation tonight, to be honest with you. I literally don't have the words to explain to you what this really, truly means. But I'll maybe try and say what Warren Wearsby said in his book, Heirs of the King. He makes this argument. Many live as slaves to fleshly desires, money, or material things when we should be living free from these things and reign in life, living like heirs of the king. Living like heirs of the king. Warren Wearsby says we should be living right now as heirs of the king, not as ones who have an earthly inheritance to have to deal with or to manage or to oversee. You want to be faithful in those things, but that's not where your heart is. You want to steward the things that God gives you well, right? And take care of those things. It's a lot of responsibility, but don't, don't, don't invest who you are in that. It's, it's very tricky. It's, it's, it's simple, simply put, the difference between them having you or you having them, right? And, and God wants you to have them, but he doesn't want them to have you. He doesn't want you to be owned and driven and motivated by worldly inheritances or possessions or money. You can't serve God, you know, both with mammon or whatever. Matthew 6, 24. You, can't serve God. you cannot serve both money or God. It's diametrically opposed to one another. And I see the same concept here in the scriptures. And so now we're setting our mind on Christ. How can we do that? How can we relieve ourselves of the worldly pressures and really be truly co-defendant on this? Well, Paul said in Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. You and I as fellow heirs in Christ are tied in with those riches and it's his paternal, fatherly joy to provide for our 
needs as children, as heirs. It's tremendous. So this concept usurps most of what the American dream is all about. This concept usurps a lot of how we've been driven the majority of our life. Got to get to work on time, right? And go, 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 go. Nevertheless, what Warren Wiersbe is saying is that we must look up to God and live for him because our provisions are already taken care of. So life in Christ is more about position than possessions. Your life today should be more about who you are in Christ, your position as a firstborn inheritor of Christ in this kingdom, rather than about the position. So no wonder Christ could walk around owning nothing, but yet being a king. He had no place to lay his head, right? Luke 9, 58. Jesus replied, foxes have holes, and the birds of the sky have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus then invited them to drop everything and to follow him and work towards the kingdom of heaven. That's when he invited his disciples to drop everything. Give up your fishing businesses and follow me. Of course, that was the high calling of a full-time ministry position. So, we're joint heirs. And we got some wonderful things now to think about. We have some heavenly, lofty, wonderful things to live for. He's the firstborn, and we're part of that. And it, and it includes all kinds of privileges and immense responsibilities. So we are in Christ as joint heirs. We have a part in his kingdom. And we don't live for a separate kingdom that we're trying to build upon our bill for ourselves here on earth you you know that that's just going to wash away anyway have you ever built a sand castle on the ocean you know you go to the beach and build one and you watch it wash away you know that that's not what our life should be focused on our life should be like in colossians 1 27 it says christ in us the hope of glory and we proclaim him and admonishing every man and building up every man to his he is mature in christ this is what i labor for paul said he labors and invests in the souls of man, mankind. Men and women are priceless, but everything else is temporary. So, it's wood, hay, and stubble. Is wood, hay, and stubble consuming your time? I hope not. And I think that this concept of the firstborn requires us to abandon Chasing after more, 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 more material possessions, and we should just simply be content and godly with what God has given us and let him rule and reign in our life. So we're part of this wealthy family. We already have tremendous wealth. We don't have to strive for it. So be who you are, right? You already have a tremendous inheritance to figure out how to participate in. I mean, it's way bigger than a plantation. What part would you have on the plantation? Well, I want to take care of the ponies. Well, I want to take care of the orange trees. Well, I want to take care of the grapes. Well, I want to take care of, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of different roles to play in inheritance. But in the, in the inheritance of the kingdom of God, it's described right here in the word of God, and it requires every single soldier with boots on the ground participating in the body of Christ, pulling together and working with all their might to fulfill the Great Commission. This is what we do. We study and we spread the word of God, and it's all about who we are in Christ. It's tremendous. So we're a part, already a part of a wealthy family in God, and earthly inheritances are now of real, really of little value. And so <clears throat> I did, however, spend some time, which I'll wrap up on G, on the third part of your document on apologetics. I thought, all right, I'll drive a couple points home here and, and wrap up. Apologetically, the firstborn does not mean in regards to Christ that he was created or inferior. Here, the Apostle Paul is most certainly attacking that heresy. The heresy of diluting the deity of Christ was on the table in the Colossian church. They were kicking it around. They were thinking about this. Angel worship was on the table. 
um, harsh treatment of the body. It was, it was a subject. They could, they could actually veer away from these things. The Judaizers could now start doing temple sacrifices for salvation again, to earn their salvation. All this, all this stuff was creeping back into the church. And that means that Christ was not inferior. He wasn't God. He wasn't their all in all. And so firstborn doesn't mean that Christ was created by God and he is no longer full deity. That's not what it means. Apologetically, we are assaulting that heresy and making it very clear here. That's not what protocost means. It is so clear. Look in verse 15, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Yes, he's called the firstborn, but what that does not mean is that he is no longer God. Keep in mind, verse 15 says, and it clarifies, he is the image of the invisible God. He is. He is, he is God, period. And the rest of the book makes it even clearer. So, image in the Greek is ekon, and it means likeness. So he's expanding upon that idea. Now, humans in the Bible are referred to as well as the likeness of God, and that can be perverted. Humans have been referred to as the ekon of God, but you see they're not the perfect image of God. John MacArthur uh, makes a list here of uh, incommunicable attributes that distinguish our image of God versus Christ's image of God of God here with this original word. For example, and these are very familiar words to you, the omniscience of God, the omnipotence of God, and the omnipresence of God. And so Christ has these communicable attributes, or these non-communicable attributes of knowing everything, having all power, and being everywhere present. But none of us have those attributes. And so we are like God, like God in an image, in a way, but we are not God, whereas Christ is God. So the fall separated us from that. But heretics view Christ as a lesser image of Christ. And some heresies out there will take you to this passage and they will try and show you that, you see, Christ was created. He's the firstborn of God. He's less than God. He's the son of God. He's not God. And you need to know this lesson is not teaching that. That's not what the scriptures are saying. He is the protocos of God, the firstborn, the chief, the exact image. He is God. All right. So I did a little bit of work there and enjoyed that. Some have said that Christ was a created being. Paul most certainly did not agree with that prominent heretical view. And he wrote that the firstborn of being Christ was God. So this is obvious that the context of this whole passage is the deity of Christ being preserved. So, how can Christ have created all things if he was uh, not a created being? That kind of further solidifies it in verse 16 for us. Christ, in fact, was not created, but he was the creator. That's what um, I learned about just one little word study, and I thought that I would park there and, and, uh, and just enjoy that word with you guys tonight. And I think that it was enjoyable to, to find out that we're really uh, supposed to be focusing upon a heavenly inheritance and participating in the church of God, which Christ gave his priceless blood for, more so than our worldly uh, income or things. So having our priorities straight according to this word was encouraging. Uh, pray with me if you would. Father, thank you for this text, this word, really, and I pray that it was beneficial to many uh, who, hear, who have heard this tonight. We love you, and thank you for the book of Colossians. Help us to continue to know you more through it. In Christ's name, amen.